Thanks for joining us again. This is our what we call Elk Talk Live. We're doing it every Wednesday night at the same time. And uh, thanks to the great folks at Botech, at Leupold, and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, we're able to bring this question and answer session to you. It's all about elk and nothing but elk. So we're going to jump right into it with a few beginning details. First, if you'd share this with your friends, that'd be great. The more people who share it, the more views it gets, the more that this project, whatever you want to title, whatever you want to put to it, the more success we're going to have with this. If you want to be notified this, uh, of this uh, in advance, or you or your friends do, remember you can text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 313131. And then today, in addition to the big June giveaway that we're having, so we're having the big June giveaway at the end of the month. Today we got another prize for you that's not even part of that. But the big prize, at the end of the month, you're going to get a Bowtech uh, Smart Bow, a Rain 7. And then uh, added to that, we're getting a Leupold Range Finder, a Full Draw 2. And then we're going to add to that a pair of binoculars, binoculars from Leupold. So, but for the best question that gets asked today, Leupold gave us what they call a slingo bag. Uh, goes over one shoulder, like, well, you can see it's got a shoulder strap. We're going to go through, and the best question of this event, this Q&A today, is going to get this. We're going to send it to you. So, anyhow, let's get with it. As it was last week, my monitor with all the questions is over here, and the camera's here. I'm going to try my best to look at the camera while I'm reading questions. So, all right, what's our first question, Michael? Why do you use a shelter when camp? What do you use for a shelter when camping and why? Well, when I'm camping anymore, usually we have base camps. Um, and there I might have a wall tent. I might use my small Hilleberg tent. Uh, just depends on how flexible I plan to be, how big our crew is going to be. Uh, if you told me I had to pick one shelter for everything that I use during the year, it'd be my Hilleberg Nalo G210. It's very durable. It's got a big vestibule. I can move. I can put it on my back and pack in. It just, it does everything I need it to do. So, all right. What caliber would you choose if you hunted elk, deer, and bear? Everyone knows I'm a big fan of the 308 Win Winchester. Uh, I've got all kinds of rifles. I think I've got four rifles that are uh, the cartridge that are chambered in the 308 win. Uh, you can get great bullets uh, uh, across the whole board. Uh, in mine, I shoot 165 grain nozzler partitions. And some people will say, well, a 308 is pretty small for elk. Well, I got a whole wall full of elk that somehow didn't get that memo that a 308 is too small for an elk. So. For deer, for bear, for elk, you give me a 308. In fact, anything in North America, I'm probably going with the 308 as the, the versatile all-around caliber. It's a short action caliber, so you can get it in lightweight rifles. All kinds of good things about a 308. So, and now everyone's gonna send the question and say, that's not what I shoot. I get it. Everything here is Randy's opinion. So take it for what it's worth. What do we got next here, Michael? Hey Randy, what state would be the best over-the-counter archery for first-time elk hunters? Hmm. Oh, true over-the-counter, you're going to have the option. There's only two states that really have true over-the-counter that I would consider, and that's Colorado and Idaho. Of those two for archery, I'd pick Idaho. If it was rifle, I'd probably pick Colorado because you have more choices of seasons, a whole bunch of other things. So. Uh, Montana had some leftover tags. A lot of states have some leftover tags. Utah actually has uh, a general season, but for me, it's not. I wouldn't put it on the same quality of the over-the-counter that you get in Colorado or in, Id or in Idaho. So, if I'm going over-the-counter, it's one of those two states. If you didn't have a camera crew, would you camp on the mountain instead of the trailhead more than you do? How would you decide? Uh, no, I probably wouldn't. I used to think that was the case. Um, what I've found is for most of my hunts, I want to be somewhat close to where the elk are so I don't have a 10-mile hike every day. Obviously, we don't want that. 
Um, but I, I would probably stick more to base camps, especially in later seasons like the post rut and the late season because I want to have more options. I don't want to just commit to one drainage and if the elk aren't there or other hunters are there, I've hauled a big camp in and now my plan went south. Now I got to go move my camp, take it into another drainage. I've just found over the course of doing this for many years, when you calculate the flexibility, the, the mobility, uh, and just the comforts you can have with a larger base camp, I'm going to have a general area and I'm not going way back in. And I just accept the fact that I got to walk in two, three, four miles each day and walk back out each night. And just, it works way better for us. So, all right. Uh, Randy, I'm working on building points for Colorado. I just got my first point. I'm not hunting there this season, unfortunately. Do I need to submit an application to get my refund or is it automatic? It's automatic. I just got my deer refund yesterday. Uh, I should be getting my elk refund anytime. So it's automatic that you get a point and it's automatic that they'll mail you your refund. What age do you recommend taking your children along on elk hunts? Ooh, that's a good question. Uh, that could be whatever works for you. Every, uh, you know, kids are going to be of different sizes at, at different ages. Every eight year old's not going to be the same. I would take them whenever you think they're ready. And when you take them, understand that they're not like your 30 year old hunting buddy. You can't march them up and down mountains. You can't take them out there and have it be miserable cold. You're taking them there to have a fun experience so that they build a passion for the outdoors and a love for hunting like you do. So use your own judgment. There is no true age. Just make sure that it's fun for them because if it's fun for them and they get into it, it's gonna be fun for you the rest of your life. How do your tactics change when weather moves in, rain, snow, and high winds? Um, it, it would depend if that was a rifle season, if that was uh, an archery season, but it, the, I can't say that they change too much. If it's really hot, my tactics will be where are they going to go so that they can find cooler places. So that's going to be deeper canyons, that's going to be patches of dark timber. And then on the flip side, if it's super cold, uh, they're going to be in places where the sun is hitting them more during the day. So it, it's kind of common sense that, hey, if I was an elk and I had this really thick coat on, where would I be when it's hot? If I was an elk and it's super, super cold and I'm trying to build fat reserves to make it through the winter, well, where would you be? You'd be in some places where the weather's not going to take quite the toll on you. So, all right. When doing a solo backpack archery hunt, is a spotting scope necessary or will binoculars be sufficient for glassing? In an archery season, I, I seldom have a spotting scope with me. In a rifle season, that is any of the periods, if it's a rifle season, I have a spotting scope with me, especially, especially the post rut and the late season. Those two seasons from about October 15th to whenever we finish hunting, those seasons are a glassing game and you cannot replace the benefits of a quality spotting scope. A lot of the next questions I'm gonna ask is what to use. I have a Leupold gold ring spotting scope. I have the 60 millimeter. They make a 50, a 60 and an 80. The 60 for me becomes that really good compromise between really good magnification, great lens quality and weight. If you're in a place where weight isn't quite that much of an issue, say you're hunting a place where elk are not that far from roads, uh, go with the 80 uh, millimeter. So the, the, you're gonna talk to a lot of hunters who give you their opinion about it. Between a 50 millimeter, 60 and 80 millimeter, for elk hunting, I'm going somewhere in the middle. Let's see, if you are hunting with very limited light and a smidgen of fog rolls in and you see the bull of your life, but it's in a deep valley and will be a lot of work bringing it in, do you shoot now or wait? Um, well, I'm, I'm not exactly sure how that question is being asked, but I'll just tell you this. A lot of times, well, when we're filming, so let's say that shooting light starts at seven in the morning for us to get good filming light, it's usually got to be about 715, 720. So it's, by the time we can get it on film, for me anyhow, it's, it's well past shooting light and it's much lighter than you probably see on camera. 
smidge and a fog rolls in, I might use that fog to go down and get in a better shooting position. But once I spot that elk and I think I have a chance to get in on them, I don't care if it's archery or whether it's rifle, I'm going to make a play on that bull. I'm going to get there, I'm going to have in my mind where's the spot I got to get to to kill that thing. And if I can get there, I'm going to try to kill it. Sometimes you get down there or part way there and the wind is different than you thought. There's a bunch of things. I don't want to blow that opportunity now that I've found an elk. Because remember in the prior uh, elk talks, I've said that I spend 90% of my time looking for elk and 10% of my time trying to kill them. Once I've found them, I don't want to blow that chance. But when I do have that chance, I'm going to try. I'm going to be pretty aggressive and I'm, I'm going to make the most of it. So what can you share about your success rate since you've started using e-scouting? Uh, and I think this person is referring to on our YouTube channel, we have a whole series about e-scouting. In other words, you drew a tag that's in a uh, state, a unit a thousand miles away, you can't get there to scout. How can you scout at home using digital tools, using your computer? Uh, my success continues to go up as the result of e-scouting. And if you watch those clips, those segments on our YouTube channel, you're going to see that there's a couple things I just can't go without. Uh, my Go Hunt Insider, I can do a ton of research there. My Onyx Maps is probably the absolute core of uh, what I do for e-scouting. Uh, and then Google Earth. Those are the three things I use a ton for e-scouting. And I can't even begin to explain how helpful that is because I am going from state to state, hunt to hunt, and I've got five days to figure it out, sort it out, and hopefully pack it out. So I, I don't have any time to waste. I gotta be as efficient as possible. I gotta have a plan for the first morning, the first afternoon, second morning, second afternoon. And then I, I kinda use those two days to say, all right, what did I learn? Now sort all that out. And then days three, four, and five, go and apply what I learned the first two days and try to get that elk tagged and get it on film. So, what calls do I use? I use the calls from Rocky Mountain Hunting Company. Uh, they have a great bugle, they have great diaphragm calls. Um, those are the ones I use. I, I wish I was as good at using them as some of you guys. I'm pretty average when it comes to using a call, uh, but those are the ones that I use. The equinox and moon phase align perfectly this year around September 20th. Do you think this will have a noticeable difference in elk behavior during this week? During this week? No, I don't. I, I'm not a big fan of moon phases as far as some people saying, oh, it moves the rut one way or the other. It doesn't move the rut. What it does do is, whether it's full moon or new moon, determines how much time they will spend out at night doing the rutting activity versus how much time they'll spend doing it in the day during legal hunting hours. It does not change when the rut happens. The rut has to happen within this certain window because the gestation period is X number of months. They have to drop those calves in late May. So you roll that back. It's gonna, the rut's gonna occur at the same time every year, whether it's full moon, new moon, you might notice some difference in intensity, I think, based on that. That's been my observation, but I don't make a big deal of it. If I've got a tag, I don't care if it's new moon, full moon, quarter moon, I'm going hunting. What precautions, if any, do you take to avoid bears? Uh, I would say that depends on if I'm in grizzly country or, or black bear country. Uh, in all places, grizzly or black bear, keep a clean camp. That's your number one thing to avoid bears. Uh, is keeping a clean camp. If I'm in grizzly country, we did a whole video probably about three weeks ago about how to elk hunt in grizzly country and be safe, be at ease that you're, you know, some people just, it's unnerving and I get it. When I first moved to Montana 27 whatever years ago, I was a little bit on edge hunting in grizzly country. There's a whole list of things you can do. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times we're there in archery season and we're doing all the things you shouldn't do. We're quiet. They say make a lot of noise. We're walking with the wind in our face. Well, they say put the wind at your back if you can. We're often solo. The, the guidelines say, no, go in groups of people. Well, there's all these things we're doing. We're, we're calling. We're, <laughs> we're doing all the wrong things to stay away from grizzly bears. 
So by just that very nature, we inherently have a higher likelihood of a grizzly bear encounter. But you know there's certain places grizzlies are going to be during the day. They're going to go someplace and they're going to bed. Well, don't go to those kind of places. You know certain times of year they're going to be way up high eating the cutworm moths. Well, don't go to those places. Other times they're going to be in the berries. So once you do a little bit of research about grizzly bears and learn their habits, the odds are you're going to lower your likelihood of an encounter. So now that I said that, this fall you'll read in the newspaper, Randy Newberg got eaten by a grizzly bear. Let's hope not. <laughs> what are the advantages or disadvantages of deboning the meat prior to packing it out? Um, this, this is another one of those it depends questions. Um, when I quarter an animal, and if I, I like to hang it overnight, and the reason I like to hang it overnight is the, it'll just cool way better. Uh, I like to keep that meat on the bone. Well, then, depending on how far of a distance I have to pack it out, I might bone it out and, and say, you know, it's just too far. I don't want to be hauling these bones. If it's not too long of a pack out, I like the rigidity of, of how the bone makes the the meat stay in a nice uh, firm uh, package, if you want to call it that, so that I can really cinch down the straps on my mystery wrench pack and that thing will not move at all. I can put, if you can put something in there really, really firm, in other words, no wobble, so that your pack is firm, it's fit exactly right, and you've got a lot of straps, you can carry a ton of weight. So a lot of times I'll leave bone in, it just depends. If it's super hot, sometimes I got to get that meat off the bone and put it out into little pieces and just let the wind blow on it. Because if you bone it out and you put this big ball of meat in a game bag, you're going to have a problem because the meat in the core, in the middle of that big ball of meat, is not going to be able to cool fast enough and it's going to spoil from the inside moving outward. So sometimes when it's really hot, we got to just cut the muscle groups apart and set them out and just let the wind take care of it, set them on a cool rock, whatever it takes to get that temperature down. So it depends. Have you hunted any of the Midwest states for out? No, I've not. Um, and given how rare those opportunities are, I'd say my odds of being able to do it are pretty, pretty slim. But how cool is it that thanks to the work of Kentucky Wildlife Agency, and the Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation, you now have, I think, 11 or 12,000 elk in the state of Kentucky. I, I could have never dreamed that. When I got out of college, there were zero elk in Kentucky. That's cool. That's conservation. How does elk migration plan go into your hunting planning? A lot. Uh, especially when I'm hunting those post rut and late season hunts. And you hear me talk about this a lot because that's when migration will have an impact. So we, a lot of the rutting during the peak rut takes place closer to the summer range. Well, when those bulls after the rut in that post rut period, when they're looking for sanctuary, they're looking for sanctuaries probably a little closer to the summer range. Well, the migration hasn't happened yet, but as quick as the first snow comes, the cold weather comes, the cows and young bulls start heading for the winter range. And as more snow comes, by the time, say, November comes around and we're in that late season period, now those bulls are looking for sanctuary closer to the winter range. So even though they haven't done the full-blown migration of what the cows and young bulls have done, they have moved their sanctuary locations from closer to the summer range to down closer to the winter range. So even if I'm not hunting a migration period, I want to know where that migration happens. I want to know where the summer range is and where the winter range is. And that's going to decide where I'm going to look for bulls that are in sanctuary mode. Is there one thing you wish you knew when you first started elk hunting? Yep. I wish I knew how hard it was going to be. <laughs> I thought that I could go buy some sort of doodad, some sort of new device, and that was going to get me success. And occasionally that happens, one out of a thousand times. I, I was using, or I, I was always looking for these shortcut ideas, shortcut uh, devices, and that kind of distracted me from mentally setting my mind to what it was going to take to consistently kill mature bulls on public land. I wish I would have known that because 
it would have helped me just focus on that to start with. And I wouldn't have been, uh, I guess, looking for shortcuts along the way. And I think I would have been a better elk hunter because of it. What do you do during midday of a hunt? Do you still search for animals or do you always take your boots off and take a nap? I think somebody is referring <laughs> to an episode of ours they saw in Wyoming when I was archery hunting and it was so hot. It was in the 90s and it's in September. And I tell the camera guys, you know what? A lot of those elk are down on the private. Let's just kick back here and we'll just take a little breather because we'd, we'd already been on a long hike. I get under a tree, kick my boots off, and get settled in for a nap, and all of a sudden Marcus says, I think I hear some elk coming. I'm like, no, those are far away. Well, about five minutes later, here comes 70 elk walking over this little rock pile, and they're all around us. In fact, there's a nice bull at 18 yards, and because I was getting ready to take a nap, I had my bow over here about three or four yards away. So do I always do that? No. Um, middle of the day, usually... Uh, if it's rifle season, I'm going to be sitting somewhere glassing. If it's archery season, I'm probably going to be sitting somewhere uh, where I know that a mature bull's got to go in water or somewhere on his path to go in water. So you can't kill a bull in camp. Well, usually you can. I've heard the, uh, the occasional story where somebody did it. But uh, so what should be the primary focus of a first-time elk hunter? Um... Hmm, there's not just one primary focus. There's so many things you need to know to be a successful public land elk hunter. Uh, but if there's one piece of knowledge I think you should acquire, it's learn everything you possibly can about an elk. Why are people successful fishermen? Because they know a lot about fish. They know what the fish do in the pre-spawn, in the spawn, in the post-spawn. Same thing with elk. Know what they need. Know what they, what they prefer to eat. Know what they do, where, where they go to find things at certain times of the year. If uh, you show me a guy who knows or a gal who knows a lot about elk, they're going to be a successful elk hunter. Oh, what is your favorite elk dish and do you have any favorite seasonings? You know, we, so uh, we, we got on this question today while we were doing a podcast earlier today. And the reason we're doing that podcast is the first two uh, episodes that we did of this Elk Talk Live series, there were so many questions we couldn't get to them all. So we said, all right, let's do a podcast. And this podcast is going to go up in a few days, uh, I think on Sunday or Monday. And we went through as many of your questions as we could. So if you ask questions in the first or second Elk Talk series that we didn't get to, Maybe tune into the podcast, we might have got to it, but one of the questions was about how do we like to cook elk? For me, uh, I like low heat, I like indirect heat, and I like it as simple as possible. I'll just put a little bit of rub on there. I use these rubs by a, a company called uh, Dog Day Spice Rubs. I think that's what it's, Dog Day? Yeah. Um, Greg and those folks there make amazing rubs, and I want the natural flavors of the meat there, so I don't cook it fast, I don't cook it well, I just let some heat indirectly do its thing, let those rubbed spices kind of sink in, and that's all I need for a, a really, really good piece of elk meat. Uh, is getting guided on an elk hunt a good way to learn to elk hunt? Yeah, it usually is. If, if, I get a ton of calls from people who say, hey, Randy, I live in Ohio. I love what you do. I love seeing it on TV or your YouTube channel, but I just, I've never done it before. I, what would you suggest I do? Well, it's not a bad idea to go with a, a reputable guide and be upfront. Tell that person, hey, you know what? I'm here to learn as much as I'm here to fill a tag. And a lot of those guides and their outfitters who they work for appreciate someone there trying to learn their craft. So I, I don't have any, I, I can't see anything wrong with somebody deciding, hey, I kind of want to go to school on someone else's knowledge. Not a bad idea at all. Uh, let's see. Do you play the thermals in the mornings and evenings? I would say if you aren't playing the thermals, your odds of killing an elk are really, really slim especially in archery season. 
If you're bow hunting and you do not understand how the thermals work in the mountains of the West, you're going to struggle because an elk's nose is every bit as good as the nose of a white-tailed deer. And they rely on that more than anything. They might get faked by what they see or what they hear, but if they smell something, they don't take any risks. They trust their nose implicitly. And so you, uh, we all know the basics of, okay, as it, as it warms in the morning, the warm air starts to rise. So you get generally an uphill thermal. In the evening when the sun goes down, the heavier starts to sink, and so you generally get a downhill thermal. But then you've got these north slopes, and you've got these this cut and that cut, and you'll have completely different wind directions just around a little knoll of a ridge because that side shaded, this side sunny. It's, uh, it is one of the arts that you need to know, that you need to learn if, if you're going to hunt the west, especially if you're going to be successful archery hunting. And I know of no better way to do it than to go out there and make the mistakes. And you're going to make them. It's just, it, it's why elk are so hard to kill in the mountains. Now you get animals on flat land where it's just a consistent steady wind not affected by thermals, a whole lot easier. But that's not usually the case in most places that elk live. What size of scope do you use on your rifle? Does it vary depending on the terrain you hunt? It does a little bit. Um, all of my scopes are gold rings made by Leupold. Uh, I like lightweight mountain rifles when I'm hunting in the, in the mountains. I, you see them on the show. I have these Howa mountain rifles. They're very lightweight. Well, I don't want to have a lightweight rifle and then put this big Hubble telescope rifle scope on there. So uh, Leupold makes a, a VX6 that is a 2 to 12 power that is on most of my lightweight rifles. Then if I'm in places where I'm hunting where weight is not a premium, I'm usually going with something that's 3 to 15, 3 to 18, something like that. Uh, do thermals affect your starting elevation or do you always start up high? No, I start wherever the trailhead is. Uh, and then if the elk are below me or above me, you never know. Uh, when I'm glassing, I'm usually up high, so maybe people, people think I start high just because a lot of times I see us glassing. But a lot of times in archery hunts, I'm not really glassing that much. I'm listening, I'm moving, I'm going to places I know the elk will be or where I've seen them. Uh, so that might be mid-mountain, it might be at the bottom, it might be at the top. But wherever it is, I'm out. You'll see I always carry a wind checker right here in my bino pouch, poof, poof, I'm always seeing what that wind is doing. For an east coaster moving west, what is the best way to meet experienced hunters who are willing to teach a newbie? I wish I had an easy answer to that. Uh, <laughs> unfortunately, all hunters, we, we seem to be pretty protective of our spots, especially, but also our knowledge. Um, the best thing I can say is join a local rod and gun club, uh, become a volunteer for one of the conservation groups, demonstrate that you're here, you're making a commitment, that, that you're engaged and interested, and usually some of the people there will instantly notice that, hey, this person's serious about elk, about whatever it is you're hunting, I, I don't mind sharing with them, hey, why don't you come with me, or why, you know, why don't you go hunt up there, I, I can't make it there this year, you go. So, uh, it's a little bit of a, of a two-way street of show that you're interested, show you're committed, and you're probably going to get a little bit more or a lot more information from the locals who've been doing it a long time. How do you find those summer to winter migration areas when e-scouting? Um, there's uh, quite a few of the fish and game agencies have hunt planners or have places on their website that show the winter range. And some of them will even show the summer range. Colorado, their interactive hunting atlas goes so far as to say, here's winter range, here's summer range, here's winter range, here are the migration corridors. So it's, those migration corridors are going to be between where the summer range is, which is usually the highest, greenest country, and where the winter range is, where the best grass is going to be later in the year. Uh, and they're going to use any of those corridors that put them as far away from people as possible from getting from summer to winter range. So, but if you can, again, a couple things we want. Share this if you would. Uh, leave your questions because we're going to give this uh, Leupold Slingo bag here. 
And uh, let me see, we got a whole list of things. Oh, if you want to get notified of this and you want to be entered in the prizes. So I was talking about the June prize package of the Bowtech Rain 7 bow, uh, the Leupold Range Finder and the Leupold Binos. To be in that, you got to text Randy, R-A-N-D-Y, to 313131. So what else do we have on here that I got to talk about? Uh, we talked about the podcast today. So if we're not getting to your questions, we're going to start throwing some of these into our podcast. Uh, so hopefully we'll catch on to them there. But if a person is a terrible bugler, bu bugle user, should they still go archery hunting in the rut? Heck yeah. I am one of my camera guys, Tyler Johnerson, kills more big bulls on public land than just about anyone I know. Tyler does not call. He doesn't call at all. Look at some of our New Mexico hunts. We've done strictly spot and stock hunts. We catch bulls out in the grasslands. We catch them hiding and, and resting in the shade of big rock piles. So just because you can't bugle or it's not something you're good at, don't let that slow you down. Go archery hunting. There is no time that is more fun to be in the woods than September. And if you've never done it, you're going to come someday after you've done it and say, Newberg was right. You don't just hear bull elk when they're bugling. You feel them. Your body vibrates. You can just, the whole woods is vibrating. Go and do it. I don't care if you're a world champion bugler or if you can't bugle at all. Go and do it. So what do we got time for? One or two more of these. What's your opinion on Nevada elk and advice for an early rifle hunt? My opinion is lucky you. Uh, I had a Nevada elk tag and it was a ton of fun. Uh, it's, uh, I would go back to, and you hear me talk about this in the previous two uh, uh, elk talk live segments. There's the five seasons of what calendar periods we hunt. Most of the Nevada seasons, if it's rifle, is going to be post rut or possibly late season. That means these bulls are looking to get away from people. Tons of mean, nasty country in Nevada bulls to get away from people so lucky you if you have that tag have you ever been stuck overnight in the high country mountains yeah uh, if you go to our YouTube channel I think it's season four season three season four season four of on your own adventures uh, I was uh, me and my camera guy, we decided, oh, we're going to wait these elk out. We're not hiking the five miles back to camp. We're going to just stay on the mountain. Well, we didn't have lots of warm gear, and the wind picked up about 45 miles an hour that night, and we were cold. We were freezing. Uh, so there's, there's, we, we've done a bunch of bag dumps on our YouTube channel that talk about this. There's a reason why that stuff is in my bag, because I learned a few hard lessons doing dumb things on the mountain. When you're out here, be prepared. Don't take anything for granted. Don't get in a hurry. Don't take unnecessary chances. Always carry with you the absolute basics. And I've had to figure that out the hard way a couple times. So, so this is the last question, I think. What time are we? Oh, we're, we're probably running a little over, but hopefully you guys are okay with this. Does hunting around others who are using horses affect how I hunt? Um, I can't say it affects how I hunt, but I don't own livestock. I don't, I don't own horses. Uh, and I can't tell you how many times I get up early. I leave the trailhead two hours before the sun comes up. And I'm just sweating and frost all over. It's November and I'm hauling a big load, my spotter, all my warm clothes. Just before I get up to the top, I hear clump, 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 clump. Here comes a bunch of guys on horses. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> I was doing good until you guys showed up. <laughs> but hey, it's public land. And it, it, trust me, if I had horses, I would be using them for elk hunting. I would say that your odds of, of having success on public land, if you have access to horses and know how to use them, which I don't, uh, your odds are going to go way, way up. So, what's your opinion on using elk in rustus, in estrus scent? Uh, I think it's a joke. 
<laughs> you want an opinion, you got it. Uh, if you get to a point where the wind is such that you need cover sense to, uh, to not scare an elk, elk have such keen noses, they've smelled you. I don't worry about any of that stuff. I, to me, it's a good way to make some guy rich by spending money on his uh, product. If you got confidence in it, you know what? If that helps you, knock yourself out. I don't use it. I don't think it's worthwhile. And it's just one more stinky, rotten thing that's going to probably open up in your backpack. So, All right, with that, remember, text Randy or text R-A-N-D-Y to 313131 and you're going to be in the contest in June for the Bowtech Bow, the Range 7 Smart Bow. You're going to be in the contest for the Leupold Range Finder and the Leupold Binos. And most of all, go elk hunting this year. We did a whole YouTube series and videos about how and why you should elk hunt every year. There's a tag out there for you. Even if you didn't draw your glory tag in the drawings this year, there's still places to go and elk hunt. And thanks for watching. Is that it?